Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to PMF IS Current Affair Prelims Test Series. This is Ashish Malik, and today we are going to discuss your test number three. I hope you guys had a good time uh, solving this test, and it was pretty much informative for you all of you. And I'm sure you all of you must have done well in this test number three. So uh, the same way we are going to discuss about like what what can be done better in these kind of questions, and in this part number one. I'm going to discuss the first 20 questions, their approach and how you can you can solve these kind of questions in your upcoming UPSC prelims exam. So let us get started with the question number one. See, the very first question was with respect to the biofuels. Now, biofuel is a kind of topic that you guys must prepare because biofuel is something which has a direct uh, you know impact on our economy uh, in terms of our environment and, and it is about the energy security of India. So very, very important topic. Um, of course, you have to have some basic information about the biofuels before we start with the particular question. So please understand when it comes to biofuels. Biofuels, uh, of course, they are they are those particular fuels which we produce uh, by some crops, by some other material, non-food crops. So basically, they are nothing but biofuel is mostly like an ethanol, right? It's what it's the one of the most common form is ethanol which we use as a biofuel and later then they are used as an alternative to the normal petrol diesel that we use uh, from the fossil fuel. So it, it, it is a, it's a way how we can uh, change or shift ourselves from the fossil based economy to the clean uh, economy uh, in terms of fuel. Now biofuels have certain generations. Okay. Now biofuels uh, depending on the raw material from which they are made. What, when, whenever you talk about the generation of a biofuel. It is simply about the differences about from where you are making that particular biofuel. If you are producing uh, the biofuel directly from, from the food crops, like you are using corn, starch, sugar, these kind of things are utilized to make the biofuel because they have the high carbon content. That's why then, then they are called the first generation biofuel. And this is how the biofuel making actually started. This is how the biofuel began at the very first place. And this technology today is very well developed. Almost everybody is using this particular technology. But since there was a problem because here uh, the biofuel was being made from the food crops. So there were speculations that what about the food security? There was a big question mark. If you keep diverting the food crops to the biofuel industry, what about the food security? And then started the second generation biofuels where the technology was producing biofuel from the no non-food crops where we, we designed the module, where we'll, we are using wood, organic waste and these kind of things we are utilizing rather than the food crops. So when the biofuel is made by the non-food crops, that is the second generation biofuel. Of course, the, the advantage of second generation biofuel is the greenhouse gas emission. Of course, it is less as compared to the first one. So the second is something which is right now in progress and this is being developed by the countries. This is still in progress. Now, third and fourth generation, they are, they are still a conceptual things. I mean, I mean, there is no country right now who are, which, is, which, is, uh, which, is, which has made these kind of techniques. But conceptually, we have the third and fourth generation biofuels. The third generation biofuel is about when you are actually producing it uh, using a microorganisms. Like for example, you are using algae. Algae is when being utilized to produce the biofuel then that is going to be called as a third generation biofuel and the and the main uh, point the unique point of this third generation would be that they are going to be carbon neutral means they are going to be so efficient in terms of their uh, uh, energy utilization that the carbon emission will equal to the carbon sequestration means overall they are not going to increase the carbon emission at all and this is probably in future we all are going to be using them. Then the fourth generation is still a very basic, you know, idea. It's not being actually utilized or mobilized so far. But the fourth generation biofuel, when in future they will come, they are going to be produced from specifically genetically engineered crops. We are going to utilize not the normal crops, but some gen genetically engineered crops, which will be done by gen genetically modifying the crops, having some genetic engineering in them. For a very specific purpose, we are going to design those crops and then we are going to produce the biofuels. And one, even one step ahead, those fourth generation would be, they are going to be carbon negative. Carbon negative means 
forget about their emission they are going to be emitting less carbon plus they are going to have more carbon sink they are going to capture and store more carbon that particular carbon which is already there in the atmosphere i mean these are the biofuels which will actually solve the problem of carbon uh, uh, you know carbon pollution because they are going to have very less emission of themselves and they are going to also absorb and store the already emitted the carbons so these third and fourth are still conceptual things okay just just keep in, keep that into mind so now if you if you look at the question you will uh, have this understanding and one more thing when when i am talking about the second generation uh, and i told you that they are made from the non food crops so basically they are this non food crops uh, is something we called as the lignocellulosic biomass this specific word is important this particular word has a connection with the second generation biofuels so what is this lignocellulosic biomass it is actually the plant biomass which is composed of cellulose hemicellulose and the lignin and it is the one which we used and from where we derive it it is derived from non food crops agriculture waste corn straw wood chips all these materials have this so called lignocellulosic biomass okay now if you look at the question you will understand the right approach of solving it the first statement said that second generation biofuel derived from the lignocellulosic biomass yes they are because we have just seen that what exactly this is so first statement is correct now look at the second statement probably you are not very sure of uh, this particular united nation convention that was happening cop27 that happened uh, last to last year and let's say you are not very sure that one, you know what what exactly happened in that particular conference but look at the statement it said that uh, united nation framework convention climate change introduced the fourth generation biofuel initiative i just told you that it is still in the idea form it is still in a very initial form so definitely there is no such fourth generation biofuel right now okay and and then on the top of that it said that you know it has given the member a target that you have to replace 50% of the fossil fuel by 2030 no such announcement has been made plus fourth generation is still in the idea stage so this statement cannot be correct now in this statement has to be one i think it was it was a medium medium kind of thing but uh, something that you can attempt all you need to have is uh, you have to read about the biofuels you should be aware of all the four generations which we have just discussed okay now what exactly what are the major things that we discuss in the conference of party 27 so we in the in the pdf we have given you uh, all the details what are the major uh, outcomes of that conference of party 27 please have a reading of that and you will understand that clearly biofuel uh, targeting was not one of the main points the question number 2 that we have was with respect to the swachh bharat mission very important question a uh, swachh bharat mission is something which which has been talk of the town it's been almost 10 years now it all started in 2014 august 2014 to be precise and uh, the mission actually started somewhere in october the announcement was in august 15th pradhan mantri speech now from 2nd october 2014 till today uh it is it is something that we have progressed we have done a lot of progress in this swachh bharat mission it has two components the gramin and the urban both are there rural and the urban part now what what this particular question is about the swachh bharat mission it is talking about the odf plus status and the third component of the question was with respect to govardhan scheme so three all the three are very different all the three uh, are something that you have to have a specific knowledge about first let's understand what what basic concepts we should be aware of so swachh bharat mission is the clean india campaign we have started from 2nd october 14 and that was that uh, particular mission was all about making india open defecation free country and uh, that was a target till 2019 of course we have succeeded a lot and uh, how we are going to make india open defecation free country by by making lots of public toilets and also uh, making them functional especially in the all rural household that was the objective of the uh, swachh bharat mission gramin plus you know given the kind of success whatever we have achieved so far now we have started the phase 2 of this particular mission and now it is going to go till 2014 uh, 2024 25 okay now very interestingly now we have added a few more components in the in the phase number 2 now not just we are not just focusing on create making the public toilets we are also uh, going to discuss we are also going to take up the case of solid liquid waste management now we we are not just giving uh, we are we just don't want to make the 
villages open defecation free but we want to go uh, the ranking a little bit more not just open defecation free but odf plus and odf plus plus what exactly they are they are this is important for us to know whenever a village is given the status of odf odf means simply it's it is very simple concept open defecation free odf means that there is not even a single person is defecating in the open there is absolutely no person defecating in the open that is odf when i say odf plus it means not just the person not defecating plus there is again availability of a community and public toilets so odf plus goes one more step ahead no no open defecation plus at least there has to be community public toilets and that to be functional well maintained the third status is odf plus plus so plus plus means whatever we have discussed in odf plus again and more on to that there has to be mechanized cleaning of the septic tanks and the sewers we we have to we have to include safe management of the fecal sludge that is called odf plus plus the phase number 2 of swachh bharat mission is actually now right now targeting odf plus maybe in future we we are going to have a odf plus plus goal as well but right now we have achieved odf plus we are on to odf plus right and the gobardhan scheme is important for us to uh, uh, to read about because OD, uh, this gobardhan scheme stands for galvanizing the organic bio or agro resource dhan see the full forms are important sometimes sometimes if you know the full form that solve the main purpose of the question if you look at this galvanizing organic bio agro resource dhan it is an umbrella initiative of the government of india basically gobar dhan is all about uh, how we are going to convert the waste whatever waste we have especially the bio waste that we have how we are going to convert that into wealth and when i say wealth basically this waste is going to get converted into energy we are going to make from the bio waste we are going to make some bio energy some bio gas bio fuel kind of thing right and that is what we have in the circular economy circular economy means whatever whatever i am using right now and later whatever this waste i am going to produce i am not going to leave it as it is i am going to use that particular waste i am going to recycle that particular waste and i am going to reuse that particular thing this is called a circular economy so whatever waste we are creating right now we are going to convert that into energy that is called gobardhan scheme please remember the ministries ministries are the most important thing you have to remember keep into the head while you are discussing any of the government scheme so it is ministry of jal shakti that started in 2018 in this gobardhan scheme okay this is important plus please be careful the gobardhan scheme it is actually a component of swachh bharat mission gramin it is covered under the swachh bharat mission uh, 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 gramin and this is executed in partnership with the state governments and even the private sector is being involved in this particular scheme now if you have learned this much if you have if you know this particular much then if you go back to the question now you will see uh, uh, what the question was asking the first statement was very very simple swachh bharat was launched with the aim of open defecation free by making india 2019 yes and now we have started the phase number 2 now please look at the statement very carefully it says odf plus this status is about fecal sludge separating sewage is was that the case no this particular statement was more relatable to odf plus plus in odf plus it was simply no open defecation plus having a public community toilet so odf plus is not about this this statement relates to odf plus plus status and look at the gobardhan scheme it said it was under the ministry of rural development was that no it was ministry of jal shakti we have just seen ministries are pretty important and uh, that is something that 90% cases upsc is going to trick you with the ministry so i highly recommend you guys be very careful with the ministries think twice think thrice before you approach that particular answer right here the answer has to be only one i think this question was a medium one and something uh, that you can attempt why why uh, how you can attempt so odf plus odf plus plus is something you have to be careful about and if you know the ministry you can simply uh, go for it so yeah this is something that that can be attempted without without any problem now the the third question which we have the question number 3 now this is a hard core topic of economy now these are the basic economy in fact in the first 20 questions majority questions you will have is from economy okay now this is these are very uh, hard core subjects now the question was with respect to statutory liquidity ratio and the cash reserve ratio if you have read about the monetary policy you know in the monetary policy we have the quantitative tools and the qualitative tools 
well slr and crr they are part of the quantitative tools of the monetary policy that we make okay now of course these two things statutory liquidity ratio and crr both has a very specific impact with respect to the money circulation whenever you change slr crr in the banking system it has a direct impact on the liquidity and thus have impact on the inflation of the country so both concepts something that you need to be quite aware of if you if you if you talk about the statutory liquidity ratio it is the minimum percentage of the deposits that commercial bank has to maintain with themselves it is slr is something that bank has to maintain with themselves only they are not going to give it to the rbi or something else SLR is the minimum percentage of the, of the deposits that bank has to maintain with itself and that they have to maintain that whole percentage in the form of liquid cash gold or other securities see understand it very clearly if let let us say i am a bank and i am having let's say i have total 100 rupees i i am I'm, i'm having 100 rupees and i want to uh, you know give 100 rupees to the uh, i have spared 100 rupees for the sake of loans or the credits right of course you cannot give all the money into the credit a bank has to keep certain percentage for the sake of some you know uh, some uh, problem that that may happen you know they there they may be crisis uh, or some kind of time maybe some some economic uh, crisis can happen so bank cannot lend everything that they have they have to keep a backup so that backup is basically this slr and right now let's say if i say uh, okay it is 18% or 19% something like that so always the statutory liquidity ratio is that minimum percentage that bank is going to keep with itself as a as a reserve requirement okay that that only just keep this money aside remaining money you can give to the credit no problem and very important thing that slr is always going to be kept by the bank with itself only slr is fixed by the rbi that is true but it is not something that bank are going to give to the rbi the 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 portion which bank is supposed to give to the rbi is the cash reserve ratio we'll talk about that please be careful the the statutory liquidity ratio it is specifically prescribed under section 24 of the banking regulation act 1949 now why i'm specifying that because you know majority of the banking act we have covered into the rbi act 1934 and 90% provisions are from 1934 act but there are certain provision which you will find mention in this again very important because in banking na these are the only two acts which are the most important act in fact 95% of the banking that you have today in our country it is by it is derived from these two acts only slr specifically you will find mention in 1949 act that is important guys now please understand whenever the bank has to reduce the credit now, now you know what what how the ba bank is going to manage the slr so if rbi wants to decrease the money supply if let's say in the economy you have lots of inflation happening and if you want to control the inflation how you how you will control the inflation to reduce the inflation ultimately you have to reduce the money supply uh, uh, the supply of the money the supply of the cash or the supply of the money that is there in the market if you want to reduce that what is the purpose you simply is going to change the slr and how it will it will do you simply have to increase the slr if slr is increased the banks are going to keep more money with themselves and they have less money to spare to give to the credit portion right if let's say right now it is 18% and if the bank increases is to 20 25% so by default out of 100 now the bank has to keep 25 as reserve only 75 rupees is available for the loan so now this is how the rbi is going to influence the money supply in the market and very similarly the cash reserve ratio also work you have the second question about the cash reserve ratio crr also works in the same manner but there is a difference with the crr the word is cash reserve ratio crr is basically the percentage of the deposit like whatever net uh, net uh, uh um, demand and time liability ndtl word stands for net demand what is a demand liability all the saving accounts or, and everything is demand account all the time liability is your fd rd all of them they are the time liabilities so basically cash reserve ratio is that percentage of the total ndtl now this is something bank has to keep with the rbi that is a very interesting uh, concept 
SLR bank has to keep with itself. CRR is that percentage. It has to give it to the RBI. It has to keep it with the RBI. Plus, whatever bank is keeping with the RBI, there is no interest paid on such reserves. I mean, you can't uh, uh, say, okay, sir, we have kept so much amount with you. You also, now you give us uh, the, uh, the interest. Interest is not being paid. CRR is, is very important. Again, if the RBI increases the CRR, that means there will be less money available to the, uh, to the bank. Right now, CRR is, let's say, 4%. Now, if you are increasing the CRR, by default, the bank is going to have less money available for, for giving it to the loan. So basically, CRR and SLR, SLR and CRR, both are increased whenever you want to decrease the inflation. Whenever you want to decrease the money supply in the market. And it is vice versa. If you have to increase, then you can simply reduce these rates. Now, these two concepts are very important. Now look at the question which what was there the question says the slr is a share of the net demand and time liability best bank must maintain in safe and liquid asset such as the government security cash and gold all in an increase in the crr when it is increased lead to increase in the money supply is it not possible we just have uh, told you whenever crr is going to increase it is always going to decrease the money supply in the economy so second question is not correct the first question uh, the first question is Correct. So answer has to be A. Uh, this question, I would say, um, of course, it, 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 it's, a, it's a, a medium kind of thing. Um, you can risk this question because the CRR and SLR, they are very basic concepts. I mean, I don't expect anybody to uh, don't have a knowledge of CRR and SLR. If you are preparing for the UPSC, you can't uh, skip these two topics. Both are very important. Now, <clears throat> The next question is with respect to the Sarfasi Act. Now in the next question, there are actually more than one concepts. I would say this is a very tough question. Why? Because there are many concepts being included in your question number four. The question is talking about Sarfasi. Sarfasi is securitization, reconstruction of the financial assets, enforcement of the security interest. It talks about the insolvency bankruptcy code. This, that is again a very important thing and how the process and everything is going to happen. So first, I'm going to discuss these two act. One, Insolvency Bankruptcy Code and Sarfasi Act because without having the knowledge of the two, you are not going to attempt these questions. And let me tell you, this was very, actually very difficult kind of question. So first, understand what the Sarfasi Act is all about. Okay, so in a very simple, to put it in a very simple manner, so let's say bank has given a loan to a person X and the loan is given to the person X and let's say that person is not going to, is, is not willing to pay the loan back and that person has become a defaulter not paying the loan back so bank of course bank has to recover right bank has to recover that loan and for the sake of recovering bank has the power from this particular act which is the Sarfasi Act this particular act allows the bank and the financial institutions that they can auction the properties like while giving the loan of course bank must have kept some guarantee no bank must have some guarantee against which the loan has been given so if that guarantee is some kind of property so utilizing the sarfasi act bank and even the other financial institutions they have a power they can auction the property of that borrower when he is not paying you back the loan so that power is with the respect to the sarfasi act now that enables the bank to reduce their non-performing assets because if bank is not going to recover, this loan will become a bad loan. No, It, it will become a bad loan. It will become a non-performing asset if the bank is not able to recover that. So anytime bank has to keep its non-performing assets minimum. So they use Sarfasi Act to sell, to auction the property, to recover the money that they have given to the defaulter person, right? Now the law is applicable throughout the country and please always remember that in the Sarfasi Act, it cover all the assets. It can be movable property, immovable assets, it can be any security that is being promised by the lender. So yes, the objective is very simple. It, it, it is exclusively a part of the loan recovery process. That is very, very important. Now if you, if you talk about the Sarfasi, you should be aware of one more important fact. Now you can, you can very well understand this act is effective only when you have a secured loan. What is the meaning of a secured loan? Secured loan is when the bank will give you the loan only 
in return of some guarantee. Only when you have some collateral with you, some kind of guarantee with you, that is called a secured loan. Because if, if you are giving the money without any collateral, without any security, then uh, Sarfasi Act cannot, cannot be mobilized. Because for Sarfasi, the act, the loan has to be secured loan. Then only you can auction and you can sell their property. No, so Sarfasi always going to be implemented against the secured loans only, where the bank has something underlying security that they can mobilize. Please important. And one more thing I would like to add here, like which particular lender have this Sarfasi Act? Not just the bank. I mean. All kind of bank, you have commercial bank, even the cooperatives banks have the power under the Sarfasi Act. Other than bank, the housing finance com uh, co companies like, like the DHFL and all that, even non-banking financial companies, can they can also use the Sarfasi Act. That's why I use the word, the Sarfasi gives power to the banks and the financial institutions. So these housing companies, non-banking financial companies, they are all part of the financial institution, uh, you know institutions of course the uh, non-banking financial uh, companies only the, uh, those companies where the NBS, nbfc has an asset size of 100 crore or more or the loan amount is at least 50 lakh in that particular case the power can be mobilized so these two things are very important now you talk about the uh, insolvency bankruptcy process that is important you know about this particular code in 2016 the government of india came with the insolvency bankruptcy code that was the that was the idea behind of the insolvency bankruptcy code was that uh, if if you are going to exit from the business if you have failed in your company you have failed your business you want to exit then the process has to be smooth and so that all the creditors they get their money in time and and whenever whenever a company is going to is has become insolvent and whenever a company wants to use the insolvency bankruptcy code and they want to declare that, okay, I have become a defaulter and I, am, I have become a bankrupt kind of person. So in that particular case, even the financial creditor, the, even the operational credit, creditor or the corporate debtor, any three of them can start the process, can file the application to invite the, the corporate insolvency resolution process. So this process can be initiated by any of the three. And please remember something you have to be kept in your mind that whenever you are going with the insolvency bankruptcy code there is a mandatory deadline like whenever like the whole process the whole resolution process must be completed in two in 330 days that is that is a mandatory deadline under which all the proceedings of the ibc needs to be done that that 330 days is kept as a deadline for all the resolution process okay so keeping those Three, four things into the mind. If now you look at the question, of course, it's a, it, it's a tough question, but you can still think about it and you can still uh, apply your knowledge here. Look at the first statement, the Sarfasi Act allowing the bank and other financial institutions, yes, to auction commercial residential properties. Yes, that first statement looks correct. Look at the second statement. It says the Sarfasi is applicable only in the case of secured loans where the bank can enforce the securities. Yes. It is only applicable for the secured loan. We have seen that like 90% cases, the word only is problematic, but now it makes sense. Okay. Now you can think of yourself also that only the bank is able to auction the property only if the loan is secured. So this particular thing looks more common if you, if you have basic idea of the Sarfasi. So the second can be derived on your own. Look at the third statement. It says, under the insolvency bankruptcy code only the financial creditor can initiate the proceedings no i told you it can be financial creditor it can be it can be the uh, the corporate uh, borrow, debtor can can do that and there are other people also who can uh, who can uh, you know initiate so there are more than one person who can initiate the insolvency bankruptcy code so yes, the third statement is wrong and fourth again the problem is with the number of days. It, it says that within five months the IBC process needs to be done. We told you it is, it is within the 330 days. So of course the, th the last one you can't, uh, you can't figure out very soon. But at least you can still think that how, in f how it is possible in five months. Because if you have to declare yourself bankrupt, you have to declare yourself insolvent, uh, probably it's going to be a la la long process, right? You know, somewhere close to one year. So I may not be knowing the 330 days as the exact one, but I can still figure out that five months looks quite less. And given the, given in, given the Indian system, 
in five months how the how the uh, you know company is going to get exit is something which looks quite difficult so yeah third is uh, fourth is also uh, not correct i know it's a tough one uh, you can you can risk it if you have a basic idea otherwise you can skip it because that is something which is too technical and you should not be uh, you know spending time and wasting time in these kind of questions because they are tough they are tricky every statement has a very deep meaning into that now if you look at the question number uh, 5 question number 5 was about the united payment interface which is better known as the upi that we have now this question has lot has more than one thing it it has concepts of the upi it has the concepts of the different kind of atms you have the white label atm and there are other kind of atms as well and it also talks about the national payment corporation of india so you need to have a basic idea about these three things and then we will again come and we'll try to solve it we know about the upi we all use the upi very well right so upi is a real time payment we know that and uh, because of the upi we are we are going to have a seamless money transfer from one bank to the another and the whole process of the upi is free of the charge and who has developed the upi upi is developed by the very important uh, this uh, department called national payment corporation of india please remember this is something which is very important a lot of people make this mistake that upi is a product of the rbi no it is a product of national payment corporation of india any payment and settlement thing has it it is covered by the national payment corporation of india every every single payment settlement claim is is settled by the national payment corporation of india that is the sole product of uh, uh, that has made upi into reality right now interestingly why why this question is so difficult and uh, it's you know it has a lot of uh, concepts if you if you if you see the second statement <clears throat> you will understand recently upi atms have been unveiled as a lot of white label atms and recently it is the hitachi payment services that has launched hitachi hitachi money spot upi atm and all these upi atms are basically the white label atms now white label atms they are offering cardless cash withdrawals they eliminate the need, need to carry the physical card and that upi atm is quite a hit and uh, everything is done again by in the collaboration of the national payment corporation of india so that makes sense okay we have now we have the upi atm that is making sense but the very important question is though these upi atms are white label atms what are these white label atms whenever you talk about the kind of atms in india we have three types of atms atm is where you go and and withdraw the money so we have the white label atms white label atms are those which are owned and operated by the non bank entities here because they are non bank entities you will have no logo at all there is no logo of any bank and they they charge a fee also from the customers whenever the customers are using the their platform white label atms are authorized by the rbi under the payment settlement system 2007 then you have another type of atm called the brown label atms brown label atms are those where the hardware and the lease of the atm machine is owned by the service provider but the cash management and connectivity is done by the sponsored bank and since they have a sponsor bank of course the sponsor bank's logo is going to be displayed on that atm machine in a brown label atms then you have a black label atm categories also black label atms are owned and operated by the foreign banks like you have city bank H hsbc standard charter all these foreign banks are owning them and operating them okay and usually the black label atms you will have more more into the metro cities and they are offering uh, the services to to the customers and uh, and uh, other customers of the foreign bank so th that is important right national payment corporation of india which has developed the upi is very important for you to know because this is the umbrella organization in india that is taking care of all retail payment settlement system in india this national payment corporation of india is actually established jointly by the rbi along with indian banking association iba under the payment settlement uh, system act 2017 let me tell you this this is the iba only uh, this indian banking association which is a very important authority when it comes to the banking system of india and this this national payment corporation of india it is registered as a non profit organization and it is it is registered under the company act 2013 now if you are able to re remember all this information you have into the mind then look at the third uh, look at the fifth question guys 
it says upi real time payment that seems money fine this first statement is correct look at the second statement upi has unveiled white label atm yes upi atm is a white label atm that is true that is correct third statement has a problem third statement says white label atms are those where hardware lease money uh, machine owned by the service provider cash management by the sponsored bank does white label has any sponsored bank no sir money bank white label uh, atms does not have any sponsored bank that is why they are having no logos since they don't have any logo that is why the color is white like th try to remember it this way because they are not sponsored by any bank white label means nothing no label white label is no label no label because there is no sponsored bank so try to remember it this way now the third statement is wrong because this sponsored bank concepts you we have in the in case of our brown atms it is the brown label atm they are having the sponsored bank and they are having the service providers right fourth statement is wrong again it says the npci the national payment corporation of india it is established by rbi along with the department of finance no it is not it is absolutely not i told you in 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 case of banking if there is any organization after the rbi it is the indian banking association so these two have made the npci as a non profit organization the the statement was about now very careful i am not asking you the correct one it is about the not correct one so there are two statements which are not correct i think this was a tough one i am not going to deny because these are not very common topics uh <clears throat> you can you at least the first statement is something that you can easily solve the second is something you can uh, at least apply some common logic third fourth is quite tough so i would say uh, you know don't don't take any of the risk because especially these four statements is is a bit difficult question so in case you are not aware please uh, don't risk it just try to skip this question because it's too technical for you for anyone who is not aware of these concepts okay now moving to the question number 6 now this question was again on the banking i told you that today we have lots of questions on economy now the second sixth question says about the cooperative banks okay now cooperative banks and very again importantly you are supposed to figure out which statement is not correct okay now first you need to know certain things about the uh, supervisory action framework you need to know about the cooperative banks and how they are going to work so let me tell you the little basics first and then we'll come back on onto that so we know so far we have we have uh, learned a lot things about the cooperative banks so ucb is urban cooperative banks and they are those financial institutions which are registered as a cooperative society as the name says they are cooperative banks so of course they are going to be registered under the cooperative society act very obvious now these bank these uh, urban cooperative banks are going to provide banking services to the urban areas and even the semi urban areas which are which are uh, you know nearby areas and these cooperative banks are basically those banks which are going to give banking services to the low income groups the small businesses and the self employed people because they are the one which are actually going to be part of the cooperative society's cooperative banks reserve bank of india has introduced the supervisory action, uh, action framework for the urban cooperative banks you must have heard about the word called as prompt corrective action see if any commercial bank any commercial bank if they are not going to perform well if they are losing their phys fiscal discipline if the non performing assets rise if their balance of payments are not good enough so whenever whenever rbi has to take a strict action on the against the commercial banks RBI always instigate and starts the prompt corrective action. Prompt corrective action is something they are kind of strict guidelines given by RBI to the commercial banks to get their finances correct. The same way like RBI has prompt corrective action for the commercial banks, the same way RBI has supervisory action framework for the urban cooperative banks. The same way because to to maintain their fiscal discipline to reduce their npas and other financial irregularities the rbi control the cooperative banks through the supervisory uh, action framework that is important guys that is very important now second thing is important that all the cooperative banks all the urban cooperative banks in india based on the cooperativeness based on the availability of the of the capital they are categorized into four different tiers 
there are four tiers of the cooperative banks uh, specifically whatever whatever is their net worth requirement it can be if it is tier 1 less than 25 crore tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 so you have specifically uh, amount for that purpose right now if you look at the question the question was very simple but little tricky as well the question first statement is absolutely correct oh, okay wait 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 first statement says rbi introduced the supervisory action framework for all cooperative banks registered under the cooperative societies of the state concern the rbi based on cooperativeness it it uh, classify it into the urban cooperative banks into three tiers are they uh, categorized into three tiers no they are not on all the three so all three statement is wrong the first statement has some problem again the first statement has a problem because it is not for all the cooperative banks it is only for the urban cooperative banks look look this this is the problem it's this uh, it says the supervisory action framework is for all co cooperative bank not for all cooperative but for the urban cooperative banks you have uh, other ca categories also right not for all only the urban cooperative that is why first wrong second wrong we know it is not the three tiers we have the four tiers we just told you so which is not correct both one and two are not correct uh, this particular question i would say uh, yeah it was a it was a medium one you can risk it if you are not sure of cutting the uh, you know you are not clearing the uh, cut off but in the very first instance this is something you have to be very careful about if you if you have read it then the question is pretty simple you can still risk it but be careful because these three tier four tier something which you have to be taking care of now question number 7 is something we already have explained uh, in the in the last test also the question number 7 is directly about which is the which is which particular deficit we are referring to now we are given a situation when the government is spending more money on revenue generating activities like tax collection then it actually collecting the revenue from those activities the answer is simply revenue deficit i already have explained in the in the last uh, uh, video as well we have a lot of kind of uh, deficits we have the budget deficit we have the fiscal deficit but look at the look at the statement now government is spending more money or spending more just for revenue generation then it actually it is connect collecting so what exactly it is supposed to be so even the common sense is say going to say it has to be revenue deficit you are spending more money for revenue generation but collecting the less revenue it has to be revenue deficit i think this was an easy one something that you can easily attempt if you want to read like i'm not going to repeat it because in the last video i have actually told you specifically about all the deficits so you can read about them and you can you can uh, you can read like what budget deficit is all about the answer here the revenue deficit uh, what exactly it means okay now i'm not going to repeat it because that would be simply wasting of the time now question number 8 question number 8 is now this is a very difficult question very typical economy question something that you really uh, not you can't solve it with any guesswork or something because it's a very specific concept the question says there are four laws given and it the question says the laws assert which of the which of this particular law says when the two type of the money in circulation both officially recognized with similar face value by the law such price fixing cause undervalued currency that is the currency whose price is fixed below the level to go out of the circulation very difficult okay i am let's say how i am going to approach it see i can still take a 50 50 chance now first of all why this question was there because uh, we have recently seen the i mean this look a little bit more of a core economy but actually this has something to do with the current affairs as well in sri lanka recently because you know the sri lankan economic crisis when sri lanka was going through the worst economic crisis they have done they have initiated one of these concepts so what what exactly this happens uh, now if you are you are you are going to have two uh, money in two currencies in circulation in sri lanka what they have done they have they have kept dollar as one currency and they have kept their own currency like there are two currencies out of the two one is called the undervalued currency that was their local currency that was the undervalued currency which is also called the bad currency for them why bad i'll explain and then you have a dollar there is uh, there are two the second currency which is having more face value which which is going to have more credibility and that is called going to be called as good uh, good currency into the market 
Now, what exactly happens? Now, the question is with respect to the uh, these four concepts. Now, what happens? Why this was done? So, Sri Lanka has basically. Now, I'll I'll, I'll tell you the the whole concept here. So, what hap what happens here? Like. During the economic crisis in Sri Lanka, I told you the two currencies. So the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, they fixed the exchange rate between the Sri Lankan rupee and the US dollar. The Sri Lankan rupee was considered to be a bad money here and US dollar considered to be a good money. Why this fixed exchange rate was done? Because the, the major object was the bad money. This money has to drive out the good money in the long term. So what they are using, what, what they are doing exactly when when a country fixes when a country recognizes two currencies one of higher value one of lower value their main purpose is that the people should actually spend more the bad currency the local currency should be spent more for a day to day purposes for a day to day purpose people should be sending spending this money and people always tend to save the good money for some future transactions it's a, it's a common it's a general behavior so people always is uh, like if you are if you are having two currencies people are always going to save more of the dollar and they will be using more of the local currency that is the idea that ultimately in the long run the sri lankan rupee is going to revive its base by when people choosing that to spend that money more and more and that is why the concept says the bad money driving out the good money in the long term well, this particular law is called the Grisham's law. This is a very interesting law where, where the good money kicks out the, uh, sorry, the bad money kicks out the good money. And this is, this is done whenever you want to revive your local currency. This is being done whenever there is a, there is a demand of making your own currency more valuable. Then this Grisham law is being applied. Now, very opposite of it, just the opposite of it, like in the Grisham law, we have the bad money kicking out the good money. You have just the opposite into the Thiers law, which says the good money going to kick out the bad money. I mean, these two are very closely related in the, in the, in the question. See, law of demand is something you can straight away reject because this particular concept has nothing to do with the law of demand. Law of the demand is simply, it is simply based on the supply demand kind of thing. I mean, because of the demand, how the demand is going to get impacted or how demand is going to drive the prices. That is, that is the law of the demand. And simply the supply law also has nothing to do in this particular case. The only confusion that should be there was between these two law. I mean, this, this is something, this is more of a 50-50 chance. I think you can, you can still risk it if you have the two options. If you are if you are having absolutely no clue, then you should skip it because the question is quite tough. I, I agree. But again, if you are able to at least eliminate the two and you have a 50 50 choice, then I think you can go and uh, take a bit of risk. But I think now you know what exactly the Grisham law is about. The, uh, the local currency should revive in the long run and bad currency should be kicking out the good one. Now the question number nine is with respect to the global innovation index okay let's say I, I have no idea the question says global innovation index is uh, you know given by which of the following so very obvious very very commonly i can say this is the the index is about the innovation okay now innovation is something when i'm going to create something innovation now look at the state uh, third one it is about the intellectual property do you see any connection between intellectual property the IPR right, intellectual property rights and the innovation both has a connection. No, the answer is WIPO. It is the world intellectual property organization that publishes global innovation index. The question was very simple, something that you can attempt with a common sense also, because you are not going to have UN development program or the world bank or world economic forum. Just focus on the word innovation and focus on the intellectual property. Certain, certain questions can be solved in this manner as well. So this particular index is the annual publication of World Intellectual Property Organization. And India has done pretty well out of 132 economies. India's rank in the late, latest, uh, uh, this global innovation index, India was at 40. India has actually improved in 2015, India was at 81st place. Now India has moved to the 40th rank thanks to the, the level of, uh, you know, the push the government has given to the innovation that was a pretty well. 
Okay, now if you want to learn more about it, so yes, uh, you should be you should read the the PDF like in the Global Innovation Index. The top five countries we have Switzerland, Sweden, US, UK, and Singapore. Now these are the best countries where the innovations are happening. India being number 40, 40th, right? And to talk about the World Intellectual Property Organization, yes, it's a specialized agency of the United Nation, which was started in way back 1967. It's a global forum. And this is a self-funding agency. It's a self-funding agency. And the main objective to, is to make to provide a platform for the intellectual property services. That is the core objective of this particular um, uh, you know, organization. Now question number 10 was with respect to the gross domestic product, the GDP. Uh, uh, now GDP, the gross value added, the base here. Now these, these three are very interesting concepts. And here you are supposed to figure out which statement was not correct. I hope we all have heard and read about GDP n number of the times. What is the GDP gross domestic product? GDP is the final value of the goods and services which are produced within the domestic territory. If this is our country India, so whatever goods and services we have produced within one year in this particular geographical territory of India, right? Now that is going to be called as the gross domestic product. The GDP can be calculated by three ways. One, income method, another is expenditure method and the third is the product method which is also the gross value added in India. Majorly these two methods are utilized. The income method is not that much utilized. In India GDP is mostly uh, calculated on the expenditure and the gross value added method. What is this gross value added? Gross value added as the name says, I am going to add value to certain thing. It is the value of the output and minus the value of the intermediate consumption basically gross value added is is measured like which particular sector of the economy is contributing how much into the gdp like how much gross value added is being done by the automobiles or the steel sector something like that the there is a relation between gross value added and the gdp guys like if i have the gross value added of various sectors if i have a gross value added of all the sectors Plus, I'm going to add the net taxes. Net taxes means the tax minus the subsidies because the government gives a lot of subsidies also. no? So the tax minus the subsidies that becomes net tax. So this gross value added by all the sectors of economy plus the net taxes combined that becomes the gross domestic product, the GDP. There's a relation between the two, like I told you, right? That is important. And please remember that in India, the the gross value GDP the, the gross domestic production the GDP it is calculated by the National Statistical Office NSO has a obligation of calculating the GDP it calculate GDP by both methods by the GVA method also and expenditure method also but only only GDP of value added method is being published the expenditure method is only kept with the NSO but they don't publish it and every two month the NSO publishes GDP of the country uh, based on the gross value added method. The product method is there. In the very recently uh, from 2015 onwards, the base year of this calculation of the GDP was shifted. It, we used to calculate GDP in two, uh, on the basis of 2004-05 as a base year, the reference year. But now of course the economy has moved ahead. So now 2011-12 is the base year. In fact, in India, uh, uh, you see after 2015, majority of the indexes are now referring. This is probably one of the most common base year that we have in our country right now, 11-12. Base years are always taken into reference. They are the benchmarks from where we are going to calculate the economy ahead. Please remember this gross value at the basic prices become the primary measure of the output uh, across the different sectors of the economy. Now, if you look at the question, you will see the first statement being absolutely correct. The gross value added is the total uh, final value of the goods and services produced. Now be careful if it is says within the domestic territory. Yes, it is domestic territory. The second says the gross value added of various sector, various sector net taxes on product amount to the GDP. I just told you, yes, this statement is also correct because uh, GVA plus the net taxes makes the GDP. Now the, the third statement says that in India, the base year for calculating GDP was shifted to this from this and the GVA at basic price becomes the, yeah, so how many of them are not correct? Answer has to be none because all three are correct. 
all three statements are correct it was a medium one but i think this is something you can attempt there is there is absolutely no problem it's very straight straightforward questions of basic economy so you can attempt that question okay no problem into that the question number 11 uh, the question number 11 was with respect to the foreign exchange reserves now again this question has many many concepts the question is about the foreign forex reserves of india it is about the the special drawing rights it talks about the uh, the reserve trench and it also talks about the gold stock of the sbi uh, of of the rbi sorry so four concepts is something that you first need to understand and then only you are going to solve it so what is a forex guys whenever i use the word forex forex actually stands for foreign Res Re exchange reserves when every country has a forex so what exactly forex means forex are those foreign current currency assets it it includes uh, all the currency all the foreign currency that i'm having the dollar the euro all the foreign currency that i have plus all the gold reserves that i am keeping as a as a base of my economy even the special drawing rights the the sdr special drawing rights are basically the unit of the account the assets that 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 we have uh, uh, we have kept with the imf international monetary fund and with the imf we, there is also a reserve trench position the that is also these two are are with imf that we keep so these four things together makes the forex of a country forex is very important if you really want to keep uh, your economy valuable you need to collect a lot of forex because ultimately you have to pay for all the imports that we make we have to pay the import into the in most likely into the dollars right so forex is always utilized for the sake of uh, clearing our import bills now india's forex has these four things yes fine correct now we have mentioned about the sdr sdr is special drawing rights many times we make this mistake what exactly sdr is first of all get into the head it is not a currency don't take a mistake don't do this mistake that okay sdr is a currency it is not a currency sdr is simply supplementary foreign exchange reserve asset which is there and it is maintained by the imf for every country's there is sdr of the country which is kept and maintained by imf it is just a supplementary foreign exchange reserve asset not a currency at all though the value of the sdr is calculated based on the five international currencies which includes dollar euro renminbi which is chinese yuan japanese yen and the british pound sterling but it itself is not a currency IMF gives allocate the SDR to the countries and they cannot be held or used by the private parties only IMF give it to the countries which are which are part of their foreign reserves as well now the third is again important we we, we have the reserve trench that is again a portion of the required quota of the currency that IMF member country must provide to the IMF again reserve trench is something which also we keep it with the IMF the member country can actually use and access this reserve trench whenever it is needed and they can do it without a service fee because ultimately the country is a member of the imf why would it give any service fee right without service fee member country can use and utilize access its reserve trench but remember it's a it's a quota quota of the currency which is there with respect to the imf gold stock of the rbi is indeed used as a backup to issue the currency in india whatever new currency we have to print every new currency that we issue the backup is the gold stock that we have so we always keep the same amount of the gold as a reserve then only we publish and print our new currency because that is done because you know you never know there can be unexpected ba ba balance of the payment problem balance of the payment crisis that can arise and if the currency is going to lose the value currency is going to lose the the credibility there has to be some backup in india's case the backup is the gold stock that we keep with the rbi okay that is a method otherwise you can't just go and wake up and print a, a, any currency you want there has to be some economics behind it now if you look at the statements the first statement is correct the forex have all these we have the foreign currency assets all the foreign uh, gold uh, sdr imf uh, uh, reserve trench position yeah first statement is correct look at the second statement please the second statement says sdrs holding refer to amount of the sdr country hold as a part of international reserves and it is an international reserve created by the world bank was it with the world bank no 
SDR has nothing to do with the World Bank. It always stays with the IMF. So second is wrong. Third says reserve trench position required to quote out the currency required by IMF. Member country can assess it but with a fee. Do you require any fee? You are already a member of the IMF. Why would you give a fee? You can assess your reserve trench without any service fee. So third statement also looks wrong. Since uh, at least at least you if you have this idea, forget about the third statement. If you have a if you have a basic idea about the statement number two, because SDR is quite famous and SDR we all know has to do something with the IMF. At least if I eliminate the statement number two, I can eliminate the whole wrong options. I'm only left with one option that is B. Now in this particular case, if you are lucky and if you get this kind of question, you should actually use the elimination technique by simply eliminating number two, I'm able to get my right answer. And yes, the fourth becomes correct. One and four has to be the right answer. Now this question was a medium one, but I would say you should attempt it because only by making the second statement eliminate, you are getting your answer. I mean, there, I, there, I don't see any problem into that because SDR is quite popular with the IMF. Even if you don't know the meaning of, of that, still you are able to solve it with a common sense. Question number 12, very obvious kind of question and something which is not very popular these days, but yes, has a very important, uh, important uh, base of the economy. The question 12 was with respect to, the, uh, you have to identify the scheme which particular scheme which was launched with objective to provide alternative to holding the physical gold, reducing the demand for physical gold, invest a part of physical gold bar coin that are purchased into financial savings. There has to be some gold scheme. But which gold scheme? Look at the options. Gold deposit scheme, gold exchange trading fund, gold mutual fund, what? But the answer has to be A. It is a sovereign gold bond scheme. You know, in India, there's a problem. Problem of that we are so much fascinated by the gold, everybody wants to have gold in their home for some purpose, one or the other, right? Now, but the burden in India is the import burden. There is a huge import burden of the gold. Every gold demand, most of the gold demand we have to import. And that was a problem that even people who are not going to utilize, many people, you know, invest in the gold only for the sake that gold prices are likely to increase in future and they, they just purchase the gold for the sake of investment. They are not purchasing it for the gold of jewelry or some other utilizations. Now for those kind of people to reduce the import burden, government came up with a scheme. Government says, okay, please do not buy the actual gold. I am giving you a sovereign gold bond scheme. And government says, okay, I will give you one bond. This is a paper gold. Okay, don't purchase the actual gold. Just take this paper gold. Paper gold has the same value. Whatever gold you want to purchase, I'll, I'm going to write it on the paper. Okay, you have purchased this much. Okay, you don't have to really buy it. And whenever the bond gets matured, whenever the bond's maturity happens, and you can sell it the anytime you want, like after, it's, it's an eight, eight year scheme. You can sell it after five, six, seven, eight years. So you will get the actual price of the gold of that particular time. So instead of purchasing the gold in real, you are actually purchasing gold on paper. Now that scheme is called the sovereign gold scheme. It, it's a very important scheme, has done wonders, reduced the import of the gold to a very drastic level. Government started this 2015 and that was under the gold monetization scheme. RBI is responsible for issuing these bonds on the behalf of the government of India with the major objectives were to provide alternative to the to holding the physical gold because holding physical gold is of no use. It was simply burden on the government. Reduce the demand of the physical gold and make people invest into the gold but through the bond scheme not through the actual physical gold. And anybody can purchase this uh, these uh, sovereign uh, bonds the minimum investment has to be 1 gram of gold. Minimum 1 gram you have to invest. Maximum can be 4 kg for individual and the Hindu United Fund, United, United Family or a maximum 20 kg for the trust. And the tenure was 8 years with exit option being from 5th, 6th and 7th year but the maximum tenure was 8. There was a fixed interest rate of 2.5% per annum and the best part these, these gold bonds can actually be used these bonds can be used as collateral also. 
if you want to purchase, if you want to take any loan by taking the loan you can use these bond as a collateral also because the, ultimately your gold bond is secured by the government so that was that was a scheme so very simple very quite obvious but yeah important scheme it was now the question number 13 was with respect to the global digital public infrastructure repository called gdpir and uh, this is also talking about india stack it is also talking about the central bank digital currency which is which is the e rupee the digital rupee that is that we all are talking about as a digital rupee or the e rupee that we have again you need to have certain basic uh, points into mind and then only you can solve this question what exactly is this digital global digital public infrastructure repository what exactly is the gdpir see it's it's a virtual repository of digital public infrastructure and this is voluntary shared by the g20 members this whole digital public infrastructure of which upi is a very key part it's a key part of the government's overall narrative about india throughout the g20 presidency and basically what india has done because you know india's upi is famous in all over the world you must be aware what 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 we have upi system of the payment in india lots of countries wants to adopt that particular upi i mean in uk france nepal uae bhutan malaysia singapore lot of countries they want to adapt india's model and for that purpose india that then comes the india stack india stack is basically it's a set of digital codes it's a set of digital public goods and it has three major things whenever anybody wants to adopt the upi system and all we actually sell, sell them the three digital codes the overall architecture of india stack includes the digital identity which is centered around the aadhaar the for the payment purpose which is upi and the data management for which we have the data enforcement protection architecture stack is basically it's a digital uh, it's a digital public goods so whenever anybody wants to purchase the india stack we we give them the three things together so that they can also make their digital infrastructure better so what exactly when whenever a country wants to go digital you have to improve the digital identities you have to uh, make the payments digital and you have to have the data management as a digital ma management system right for that purpose we have the india stack and india stack aims to unlock the economic primitives of identity for identity you have the aadhaar for data you have the management for the payment you have the upi you know we 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 sell these three products to other countries and lot of people lot of countries are interested in buying that central bank digital currency cbdc is actually the digital rupee that we are having it's a digital currency launched by the rbi it is a legal tender that we have it is issued by the central bank of uh, of india that is the rbi central bank digital currency though it's a digital currency but it has the same value as a fiat currency what is a fiat currency by the way we use the word fiat currency for that particular national currency which is not just backed by the physical any commodity of the gold or something fiat currency is that currency which is backed by the government of that country like you have the dollar you have the indian rupee on indian rupee there is a signature of the rbi governor no that is a fiat currency because it is backed by the government it is not it is not uh, dependent on any commodity or it is not valued against any commodity no if the government says it is a 500 rupees note it is a 500 rupees note because government has guaranteed you that that's a fiat currency and same value we and the same credibility we have for the central bank digital currency cbdc now if you look at the question guys look at the question the question number 13 was with respect to so now we know the uh, we know about the global digital public infrastructure it's it is shared by the uh, first statement looks co correct the second was the india stack yes it india stack you have we know there are digital codes uh, these are the three items that we include in india stack we told you second is correct look at the third currency third statement has a problem third statement says central bank digital currency is a legal tender issued by central bank fine digital form fine but it says it is not the same as fiat currency it is same as fiat currency it is same because it is backed by the central government the government of india so third statement looks wrong answer has to be only two uh, i would say it's a medium question but something that you can solve you just think about it why why you think india is going to make any currency which is not fiat fiat currency is more credible na so this cannot be the answer if that is the case 
India, in India, it is all about the trust. In India, if we are having a digital currency, it is always going to be a fiat currency. Because without government backing, people are not going to accept it. So very with the common sense, you can eliminate number three. It looks very problematic, no? So I think you should attempt this question. Uh, just keeping it to the mind, the basic idea how Indian banking and Indian, Indian financial system works. That, you can, that can be applied. Now the question number 14 was with respect to application supported by blocked amount. Now this is something which is actually making lots of news. What is this ASBA, which, which is this application supported by blocked amount? Now this, this is important, you should be aware of this particular fact. And uh, let's see what you first need to know about it. So what is this ASBA system all about? See, yeah, you know, uh, what happens guys in, in India, if you are going to invest in the IPO, okay, what is an IPO? It is the initial public offering. If any, any startup wants to go public for the first time, it is going to sell its stocks, its share for the first time. It is done in the primary market. Primary market is those, that market where you have the IPOs. In 2008, SB, uh, the SEBI, the Securities and Exchange Board of India, SEBI, has started this ASBA process where, where the investor, whosoever want to invest in the upcoming IPO, does not have to transfer the whole amount to any third party. You can simply block the application amount in your own bank instead of transferring it to the other bank. If I am going to purchase the IPO, let's say if I am going to purchase it for, let's say, I'm going to invest 10 crore rupees or uh, 50 crore rupees into that, whatever amount I need. So whatever amount I'm going to invest, I just have to start the ASBA process and that particular amount of the money is going to be kept aside into my own bank account. I don't have to transfer it to somebody else. And recently, recently, the SEBI said the same process we are also going to start for the secondary market. Secondary market is the regular stock market that you and me can go and purchase. Uh, you know the stocks but in the in this why this this process is important because you will actually be receiving the interest you if you are keeping that money aside whenever the IPO comes you can straight away go and purchase the IPO till the whole process gets settled down till the time your money actually gets deducted you will still be earning interest that is the that is the that is the benefit Otherwise, what used to happen if you you are you you used to uh, transfer the money to anybody else, then they are going to earn the interest on your money. So now you can earn the interest on your block funds. That is one benefit. In public issues and the right issues, all investors have to mandatorily apply through uh, ASBA. Now these are the conditions by SBI uh, by SEBI. Even if it is a public issue or the right issue, in both cases, the whole process has to has to be done by the ASBA. Now, if you look at the question, if you look at the question, what this question says? It says this ASBA process, it is introduced by SEBI, yes, making IPO, yes, or the right issue subscription in the primary market, yes. So these three things you need to remember, the ASBA, the SEBI, IPO and the primary market. Public issue, right issue, both cases it is mandatory, it is mandatory. So right answer has to be C. I mean, I know this question was a bit tough, but I think we have already discussed this same kind of question was in test number one also, if you remember. So this question is a bit tough one. I would say you can take a risk if you have the idea. Otherwise, you should skip because it, this is not an easy question. It is not an easy question. Uh, you have to be a little bit, you have to have a knowledge about it. Otherwise, not easy to remember it. Okay, the question number 15 was with respect to the, uh, again, this question was with respect to the bonds. So the question is again core topic of the economy. It talks about the relationship, the inverse relationship between the bond prices and the bond yields. Yes, there is inverse relationship. What exactly is there? You need to understand. And you also should be aware of the, of the, the, the government bonds, the government securities, the GSEX. That is important. You need to know what is a treasury bill. You need to know what is a, what's a dated securities. These two concepts are important. So you know guys what what is what how the bond market works what, well uh, in a, in a very simple manner if i if i tell you uh, how does the bond market works let's say if government wants to raise a money government is going to you know release some of the bonds let's say this is a bond and its its face value is a 100 rupees value it's a 100 rupees bond 
Now government says, okay, this is a hundred rupees bond, but I'm going to give you this bond in let's say uh, 90 rupees. Now that, that is a discounted value. And government says for the, for the five years, I'm going to keep that money with me. After five years, uh, instead of 90, you can, you can get your 100 rupees. There would be a profit of 10 rupees. So bond is always given at a discounted value. The people purchase that for a fixed amount of time. When they resell those bonds, they get their actual money, making some profit for them. Now that profit, that return investor realizes on the bond is called the bond yield. Bond yield means the profit, the return that I'm going to make on my bond. There is always a, a inverse relationship between the bond price and the bond yield. If the bond price is too high, if the bond price is too high, let's say instead of 90, the price becomes 95. If the bond price becomes high, the profit of the investors reduces. No, If the bond price will, will rise, the bond yield is going to shrink. If the bond price gets more down, you are going to make more money. You are going to make more return. So price, bond price and bond yield are always the inversely proportional to each other. That is one thing you need to remember. Secondly, it is very important for you to have a very basic idea with respect to the government securities. What is a government security? GSEC government security is actually a tradable instrument issued by the central government even the state government can release. So one thing you keep into the mind, the government security is that it is that particular kind of government bond, which a central government can also issue and a state government can also issue. Now, why it is called a government security? Because it the, the burden, the debt obligation lies with the government. It is, it is the responsibility of the government. And that is why, because they are backed by the government, they are considered to be risk-free guilt edge instrument. Why they are called risk-free instruments? Because, because I mean the government, the ultimate burden is on the government. Government cannot uh, say no to the people because the government has, it, it is about the credibility of the government, right? Now the government securities are basically released for the short term and for the long term. Whenever the central government is going to release, central bank, uh, central government, can issue the government bonds, the government securities for the short term as well, as well as the long term. Short term is basically less than one year. And long term is something which is more than one year. If it is less than one year short term, the government securities include the treasury bills. Okay, for the long term, the government securities are going to include the government bonds and the dated securities, where the maturity period is more than one year. Central government can issue both long and short term, but the state government cannot issue the short term things. The state government can issue only the bonds and dated securities that are more than one years. So please remember the state government cannot issue the treasury bills. Treasury bill is only and only to be issued by the central government because they are short term periods. And all the bonds and dated securities issued by the state government are called the state development loans. I mean, remember this much and let's get back to the question number 15. What question 15 says? Look at the question. It says inverse relationship between the bond price, bond yield. Yes, that first statement is correct. Second says the central government issue both the treasury bill, the short term, the bond dated for the long term. Yes. State issues only the bonds dated security called the state development goals, loans. Yeah, both are correct. Now here also, if you are not aware of the concept, you may find, okay, it is only. So see, every statement have, having only is not wrong. There are some statements which actually make sense with the only, right? In this particular case, it's, it, this question was a medium one. And I think <coughs> if, you, if you have read about once these two things, yeah. Uh, you can risk it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying going to uh, skip it because these are very important points. The first is something you can, you can uh, think of your own. Any price is increased, it will reduce my yield, my return, my profit. So first thing looks quite uh, something that you can think of on your own. Second is a bit more technical. So yeah. The question number 16 was with respect to the stock exchange once again. Okay, now this, this is something we already have discussed. Now look at the first statement. 
the read the first statement it says the stock exchange we all have heard of the stock exchange we all have heard what a stock market is stock exchange is a marketplace where securities shares they are bought and sold allows the company to raise capital make investment i think this is probably the most simple statement that you have so first statement is absolutely correct look at the second statement it says the sensex is a benchmark index of indian stock market indian stock market has two uh, two uh, market right we have the bombay stock exchange bombay stock exchange bsc and the nsc please tell me the sensex lies with bsc bsc is uh, uh, the whole see what is a sensex sensex basically in at the bombay stock exchange there are thousands and thousands of the stocks you can't go and read about every stock to understand if the market is going up or down right so what exactly bsc does it has made its own index called the sensex it's a benchmark index of the bsc now bsc's sensex has 30 most active stocks 30 most or the top stocks which are being traded so basically by by understanding or by talking about these 30 you have the idea if the market going is going up or the down sensex does not represent 50 companies it is only the 30 top stocks it is the nsc that has something called as nifty and nifty is something called nifty 50 why nifty 50 because nifty has 50 companies into the account so if you have to understand the movement of the nsc you go and look at the nifty if you want to go the uh, see the movement of the bsc you have to see the sensex but sensex has only 30 stocks not the 50 companies 50 is nifty 50 nifty is nsc Okay, so remember this term. This term is important. Nifty Fifty. The term is important. So second statement is wrong. First is correct. I think this was a this was an easy one. We all know about the Sensex. We all know about the Nifty Fifty. And first statement was very organic, very simple. There is nothing important. Question number seventeen is with respect to the startup funding. I think this was something which was very much in the news. so this is all about this because in the last couple of years we have got this startup culture in india now the question says the startup funding a certain tax was introduced in 2012 to prevent the disguising bribes commission as investment the tax imposed when the startup receives the funding at valuation higher than the market value price, uh, uh, market value fair market value which is the tax that we are talking about are we going are we talking about the corporate tax of course not we know what is a corporate tax corporate tax is simply the tax which is which is charged on the profit that the corporate is making that is a corporate tax it's a it's a direct tax so cannot be the case what is a capital gain tax capital gain tax is basically the tax that you have to pay to the government it is also a direct tax that you have to pay to the government whenever whenever uh, any of your fixed instruments is making some profit for example like my fd my uh, fixed deposit recurring deposit whenever whenever i am earning money by some banking services so whatever whatever money i am making or even the interest that i am making i have to pay some in, uh, tax on that also that is my capital gain tax or even i'm if i have if i have sold some property or i, I have got the money from by selling the property that on that profit also i have to pay some tax that is called capital gain tax capital gain is something whenever you are earning anything when you whenever you are uh, you have earned any money on that you have to pay the capital gain tax so that is also not related to the startups now dividend distribution fund clearly is not something to do with the initial funding when startups are receiving funding when startups are only receiving the funding initial funding is given by angel investors it is the angel investors which give the funding in the beginning you have the venture capitalist you have the you have other uh, uh, you know vc which is venture capitalist which invest in your uh, startups so and dividend distribution comes very late dividend is something which comes very late dividend is a derivative instrument it has nothing to do with the startups and especially nothing to do with the startup funding the only logical case is the angel tax because what is an angel tax it is it is when the angel investors gives money to the startup so basically what happens guys whenever a startup is receiving money from the angel investor let's say Uh, they have they have got a hundred crore rupees investment. So what government now does in two thousand twelve? What government has done? Because it, there was a case when lot of uh, investors they were they were trying to this this was becoming a you know 
uh, a way of money laundering also this, this this could be a case of money laundering where all these big players are trying to you know relocate or re, uh, reinvest their black money into the system by money laundering you never know which money and what money is coming so basically what was there and and there was a there was a whole game of you know uh, startups they were receiving their uh, their fund at a very higher valuation if it was all about the higher valuation that then remember the stock market is going to swell up whenever the ipo comes so basically to control that you know to to make the valuation of the startup at a fair level to to stop any money laundering kind of things 2012 government came with the idea of the angel tax what angel tax says it says whenever the startup is going to receive any funding from angel investor the that the total investment is to be considered as a income of the startup and on that you have to pay you have to pay the angel tax that was the concept of course start startups didn't uh, had uh, objected on that <clears throat> and uh, still there is there are objections on the angel tax and uh, talking about uh, dividend distribution that this tax was discontinued after 2020 so you don't have anything called as dividend distribution as of now so yeah the uh, logical answer has to be c so i have eliminated the three keeping only startup and funding into the mind and now i have received the i have got the answer as c as angel takes so i think this was this was a, a medium level question but i think you can risk it because at least the two things you can eliminate you you could have eliminated the other options and then logically you have uh, you would have uh, you know got the right answer question number 18 is with respect to a scheme very important scheme which is the remission of the duties or the taxes on the export products called the road tap scheme now it says that the scheme is under the ministry of finance introduced to replace existing uh, merchandise export from india mice scheme see the first statement is correct with one problem there the ministry is not right you we know that we have got the uh, road tap scheme and uh, it has replaced the mice scheme but the ministry of finance is not the right ministry under under which we have got the road tap it, it, it is the ministry of corporate affairs now please look at the uh, sorry ministry of commerce and industry not corporate affairs ministry of commerce and industries now look at the look at the scheme first try to understand the scheme first and you will get to know why it is being why the, it has replaced the other scheme so this particular scheme road tap it was introduced to replace this because there were there were some objections from the uh, wto the world trading trading organization wto that has ruled against india's export subsidy and merchandise export from india scheme me scheme was actually given was actually giving lot of subsidies to boost the export ecosystem of india and many countries objected you know that you know this is not fair that you are giving subsidies to boost your exports and that is why wto has had objected and to comply with the rules of WTO, India replaced this scheme with the road tap scheme. But the scheme is under Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Okay, that is important. Now, please, please uh, 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 remember this scheme, it does ensure that exporters receive the refunds and embedded taxes and duties that were previously non-recoverable. In fact, now after replacing the me scheme, Rotep had has was made even more uh, inclusive it was made even more comprehensive now it is actually benefiting the exporter more because they are able to recover uh, get the refund on all the embedded taxes and duties which were which was not the case earlier and all all these duties and taxes are covered under this it includes the vat excise electricity duty monday tax stamp duty everything is being covered so it, it is actually benefiting the exporter more than the previous scheme. Now, if you look at look at the statement, guys, the first statement says the this ministry. Ha, I told you ministry has a problem. It, it has to be ministry of uh, commerce and um, it, it is not with the ministry of finance. So first is wrong. Second statement is correct. It says road tap ensure exporter receive refund on embedded previously non including the wet and everything. Yeah, answer has to be B. Now this question, yeah, uh, it was a medium one. You can risk it. 
otherwise you skip because these these uh, ministries are very important probably this second statement will make you a little bit uh, uh, uncomfortable but if you if you apply this logic that you know whenever you have to boost the export if it is all about export boosting of course these things are to be there the exporters need to get the incentives like that so that case you can risk it also if you want okay now uh, question number 19 was with respect to GST okay now please before I get into the detail look at the statement it says uh, with respect to GST text the recommendations of the GST council are binding on the union and the government they can never be binding well GST's council is something where you have the representation of the union and the states every decision on taxation matter especially when it comes to taxation no decision can be binding it has to have the consensus of the union and the state and GST being already uh, a text which is having a bit of controversy with itself it was very hard to uh, you know ensure and uh, to, to make to get the support of the state so you cannot think of making GST councils recommendation as binding just apply your logic they can never be binding taxation is something where state and center has to uh, keep negotiating and renegotiating so first cannot be the right answer second says the GST appellate tribunal is a specially specialized authority to resolve the disputes uh, with principal bench at Delhi yeah so this location is a bit uh, tricky it could be other place also but yeah when it when you think of the GST it's a pan India kind of thing and New Delhi is probably the best location to have the principal bench so second statement looks correct but this first one cannot be the right answer of course if there is any problem any dispute there has to be a appellate tribunal and especially for a GST like uh, domain for all disputes of GST we have got a dedicated appellate tribunal which was there as, uh, under the GST act also so second statement is correct first is not I think this question was easy because I have only applied my common sense and I still have got the right answer because if you think of this question as a difficult one you think how to approach it by approaching it the right way you can still solve it guys there is no problem that you can think of so first not correct the second is correct it is it is actually the supreme court that has recommended that GST council recommendations are only persuasive they are not binding it the court has pointed out under the uh, you know article 246a it is only the recommendatory uh, portion has to be there because state and the parliament both have the simultaneous powers that's why it cannot be binding then you have the last question of the day which is operation sajag sajag means alert sajag in, in, in uh, english is alert operation sajag is carried out by which of the following see there i do not see any logic of uh, you know military of india usa being a part of it i mean yeah sajag can be by navy army coast guard any anything can be there but you know operation sajag was related to indian coast guard this question i think the, i think you can take a risk why because uh, you can eliminate the army from here uh, sajag has to do something with the coastline that you can think of could be army uh, could be navy could be coastal guard but you know these kind of exercises are mostly with respect to the coastal guards coastal guards is something which is very essential part of our uh, maritime security so right answer has to be a I think the question was a medium one you can you can risk it if you if you have the appetite to take a risk you can you can still risk it uh, to talk about the Sajag Sajag is um, a coastal security drill along the western coast of India conducted by the Indian Coast Guard Indian Coast Guard is very important when it comes to India's maritime interest because uh, these are the the this particular domain these armed forces they operate under ministry of defense and they have this mandate they have to enforce all the maritime laws over the territorial waters of india including the contiguous and exclusive economic zones which lies till 200 nautical miles till 200 nautical mile from the coastline the domain lies with the indian coast guard and for that purpose the right answer has to be a so that was all about the 20 questions I, it was a lengthy one i know uh, the questions were very lengthy and i hope we have uh, explained them well you have learned a lot of things from this particular video 
please do let me know your feedback uh, how you have find these uh, 20 questions and all my best wishes for your upcoming exams stay tuned with pmf is and uh, keep learning with us enjoy see you in the part number 2 with next 20 uh, set of questions take care jai hind jai bharat